listening to the Novel Universe Podcast, a monthly YA lit podcast hosted by Dawn Abram and Elise Martinez, YA librarians from the Chicagoland area. Each episode features reviews and rants on new and upcoming YA books. We are here to help you navigate your TBR pile. What's good, what's bad, and everything in between. I'm Elise, the rejecter of romance. What will now be our last episode of a read along with the universe yeah the beautiful edition um we originally said that we were going to talk about pages 292 to 368 today but we're actually going to do 292 to the rest of the book because neither i don't want to talk about this book I, anymore. yeah i can't keep reading this book i just no. need to get it done so again if you have not finished the book and for some reason have been listening along to this podcast maybe don't but otherwise we're gonna jump right in so this was a struggle bus of a section <laughs> struggle bus that's a new one I, I i didn't initially take a lot of notes but then i had a lot of opinions after the book ended um in this section when we leave off on page 292 Celine had just been kicked out of the convent and turns to her friends at the Court of the Lions for help, assistance, whatever. And so they put her up at this hotel called Hotel Dumain. And the very next chapter is the vampire whose identity heretofore is unknown. And they're recommend or they're like recollecting about how they've been inside before and they know exactly what room she's in. That should have been the clue. That should have been the clue right there. But yet it shouldn't have, because the person who is the vampire was literally mentioned like three times, if that, in the entirety of the novel, and it was nothing more than like a, oh, she's dead. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So do we want to just jump right out and say who's who and what's what, and then yeah, talk man, about it? Yeah, man, we don't need to do no recaps. Right. right. this shit. Um, so, <laughs> go ahead. the... We learned that the vampire and or the murderer is in fact uh, Bastion's dead sister, Emily. And she is exacting revenge? Yes. Yes. And she's <laughs> she is using Nigel to do her bidding. So at the end, it's it it's kind of seems like Nigel's the one that's the murderer, but then you're like, eh, is he? Because the next chapter is like her explaining who she is. Why she's upset at her family, what she's been up to lately, and it's like, huh? Yeah, it's, um, she, she introduced a lot of new characters in the last quarter of the book, which yeah. is not, it's, it's not a good shitty. thing to do. Yeah, it's not. I, yeah. I, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> it, it leaves the reader confused because you ask yourself, I'm sorry, was I supposed to pay attention to a dead person in a memory that you br you barely bring up? Like, literally, Bastion just mentions her in passing. Yeah. I'm sorry, no. No. Um, she tried to throw us, I think, with the mention of... So we, we do get a, a tiny bit more development to the vampire itself. Again, we don't know their identity at the beginning of this section, but they are talking about this this lover that they had whose name was Marin and she was for some reason she some reason betrayed the vampire and so the vampire betrayed her and it was a whole thing we don't know what the betrayal had to do with anything the what the person or what the vampire did was not revealed and likewise what the what the narrator vampire did was also not revealed so now that we know that it's Marin and Emily I think she tried to throw us with the like, oh, the vampire couldn't be a woman, because she's like, she's like toying with lesbian queerness in this book, and I didn't yeah. appreciate it. If you're gonna put it in there, really give it to the reader. Don't use it as a plot device. I, I mean, once again, this could have been a moment of brilliance, because as really a reader, I, I just, I just assumed it was a man because I that's what we do. Yeah. We just assumed it was a man who was stalking her and, you know, and good on her for trying to flip it. Mm -hmm. 
but the execution of it was oh, just yeah. like Terrible. I mean it was so bad that I didn't even realize that it was Emily until Elise told me and I was like oh I must have missed that and I had to reread it and I was like oh yeah it is her yeah it's the the reveal was not as impactful as I believe that she intended it to be um, and I agree with you. I think she attempts to subvert the, you know, heteronormative, yeah. um, stereotypical vampire in the mythology, but it it was not committed to enough. There is too many. There are too many scenes in this book where it's just Celine talking about God knows fucking what and scowling at Bastion and reminding the reader that she's strong and she's a lion. And it's like it just. It was such a waste of of bookish real estate. Yeah. Like, so another gripe that I had with this book is... Wait, wait, wait. We're, we're talk, are we talking about so just I'm talking, the section? I am just talking about the section. Okay. And we're I'm going to do our I'm huge sticking, gripe at the end. Well, I'm sticking with the vampire mythology. Okay. In this book, another thing that she attempts to do is introduce a, a conflict between two factions of vampires. She doesn't call them covens, really. She doesn't call them anything. Just that one is the Brotherhood and one is the Fallen. This was so ill-developed that I literally cannot explain to you what's what. I don't even think she explained it. If she did, I missed it. She, I don't, well, after I missed that huge bombshell at the end, I don't know if I trust myself, but I don't think she really all I know is, explains it. Right, like, all I know is that Nicodemus, St. Germain, and therefore Bastion are part of the Fallen, as are everyone in the Court of the Lions, and then Emily... I believe. Is it the other way around? And other people are part of the Brotherhood. So I think she felt rejected by her family when they, like, didn't turn her after she yeah. died. And, like, was like, I'm jumping ship to the Brotherhood. I'm going to serve them. Okay. I'm going to be part of that faction. But again, I may be wrong. I don't know. Frankly, I don't care because I'm not reading book two. But again, she's she's, like, building up a conflict for the next book that is not a part of the plot at all. <sighs> I you know, I'm just, like, say. I'm, I'm just, like, running through talk? my mind. All of these <sighs> stupid scenes that I'm, like, that are, like, running through my mind that she could have left out in exchange for, like, really jumping into the vampire mythology and paranormal, like, conflict behind this New Orleans visage. Like, I just, I feel really, like... This could have been a good book mm -hmm. in, in a different set of hands. Yeah. There is goodness here, but it was like 430 pages of just random bits of details that I think she thought would be interesting to read about that she threw together. This was a setup for a second book. That's it. Nothing it's happens here except setting up. It's a 450 page Absolutely. Prequel. Where was her editor? I don't know. Because cleaned up, this could have been very interesting. That's what pisses me off the most. I, I literally have nothing happens in these chapters. Like I don't, yeah. I don't. They go to parties, and she reminds the reader that um, she's strong and she's gonna get on with life. You know, again, what was the point of? I mean, I know that in this time period, she has to position her female characters within certain institutions so that they are able to move around the world. I get that. So, like, that's why the, the convent was a part of her story at first, but I feel like it just wasn't well thought out. No, it was because pointless. Because after she leaves the convent on page 290-whatever, it is literally never mentioned again. No. It's, it was... So, like... It I means I, to an end. It was... It, yeah. it contributed nothing. Like, I would have preferred that she would have just been sent to, like, a relative in New Orleans or something where it was, like, not a waste of time. Yeah. And she, like, why couldn't she come with her dad? She she references and mentions her dad all throughout the story and how he's this linguist. And, like, he could have really played a part to show that, you know, Celine doesn't have daddy issues. She doesn't have issues with, you know, interacting with men or anything like that. But, like, her dad is literally just told to us through a series of like one or two memories you know so I didn't really get a sense of her past other than it was just this one guy who raped her that's all we know about her and then like her dad told her not to like talk about her mom do he we didn't actually know, rape her no do we know if she just got on a boat and hightailed it out of there or if her dad put her on the boat I think to... her dad put her on the so boat her dad knew about the murder like... I don't exactly I don't know I guess it's not her dad is a non-issue in this book like, she's just out there by herself, and that's not even historically factual. 
Like, where was their chaperone? They traveled with no chaperone. You didn't walk outside your house without a male relative or a chaperone in those days. So, like, just, again, th this is just one example of the cluster that is this book. Yeah. <laughs> This is going to be a ranty episode, well, if it's not been a very ranty short the episode. Whole time, I don't think we've liked anything about this. No. Book. Um. So what happens to Bastion? Let's talk about him real quick, I guess. I I mean that whole, the whole ending with her on her knees and sobbing. And <laughs> I love you. I guess that was supposed to be emotional, and I was supposed Dude, to like cry. I, I was laughing. <laughs> I was too. I was doing the. Save him, please save him. And the guy's just like, no. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. But we know that Nicodemus, his uncle, has the power to do so. I'm confused. Isn't the entire reason that he was trying to separate Celine and and Bastion was because he's trying to protect his legacy? And maybe he don't want no nasty vampires in his family. He I, is a vampire. Maybe he don't want no more. I don't. Maybe he wants to be the only one. I don't know why he, he wasn't saving the mortal, his mortal family members. I don't know why. I don't get it. Yeah, I'm, I'm so confused. Anyway, um, I didn't try to really figure it out either because I won't be reading book two. Uh, so apologies on that one. But uh, do you have any more points to make before we move into our uh, discuss uh, that larger discussion? Mm. Um, I would like to make a point of... <laughs> I love on page 390 of 400 and something that we were introduced to what's his name william is that his name who detective michael michael <laughs> i don't know where that came from <laughs> i love that we're just introduced to two random oh my god family yes. members okay just so we can introduce emily in the end yeah yeah the way he that never, she did he ever mentioned that he had a grandma no had a cousin? Uh, no okay so um after nigel is initially murdered or what we think was nigel who was murdered Celine is taken to the police station to be kept safe. And she's like bitching and moaning about how she's being kept against her will and how she's going to escape at midnight and blah, blah, blah. She it's like, figures oh out my the God. whole thing by yeah. looking at it. Yeah. She figures out the entire thing by looking at Michael's detective work. So you're telling me that Michael, the professional detective, was looking at this and was like, hmm, I don't know what's going on. Oh, because she conveniently left out a little detail that of that course the vampire told her before. Is the solvent of all the things. I don't think that And I makes still sense. I still don't know why Emily is targeting her. Because she's trying to get to Bastion through her. But she committed the first murder before before they had even met. I don't know what that first girl had to do with anything. I don't Did either. Say? No, she just was. Uh, she was just a, a ploy to get the mystery going. She had nothing to do with anyone. Maybe she was dating Bastion. Maybe we missed that. Because she does say "my lover," blah blah blah. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't care to go and. Look I don't it up. know. Mm -mm. Um, what were you? What were you talking about? How Adia just introduced two oh, characters. Yeah. I don't know she where. has the worst. Um, it, the worst. Transitions. Transitions in terms of both storytelling and, like, the actual bringing new characters into the plot. Yeah, so Celine is, like, being held against her will, and while she's figuring it out, Michael comes, and he decides to bring his family to work day. <laughs> it's a, it's a bring your grandma and cousin to work day in 1872 New Orleans, and the grandma brings Rivolata and offers it to this random stranger, and and jokes about how her son is suddenly flabbergasted in her presence and oh it's all good like what the fuck did that have to do with I anything just, i just thought that it was a way to introduce michael into book two a little bit more i was like oh they're just she's just setting up the grandma and oh cheeky cheeky he <laughs> thinks you're cute like, in a love triangle, I didn't realize that freaking Luca is a vampire or a werewolf or whatever the hell he is. Because that was not made known, no. other than the fact that they're, like, Italian. I don't, am I supposed to assume that every Italian in this book is a vampire? I don't know. I don't know what I was supposed to glean from that scene, other than it was annoying as shit. <laughs> I, oh my god. And is this I'm section like, the first time we meet Nicodemus? Yeah. 
Nicodemus was, has only been spoken of. He was a waste. He oh was my god, awful. I hated him. I think he was supposed to be like a uh, older, mysterious. Right. No. No, he was just boring and lame and didn't. Okay, so you don't really. You're telling me that all of the power, privilege, and resources that you have, you can't manage to get rid of Celine yourself. Easy solution back in the day would have just to find a really rich family across the country, maybe even New York City, and pay for a governorship. Uh, 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 what, what is it called? Not a governorship. Governorship, thank you. That would have been a very easy out. Send her away. And you're telling me you couldn't even like manage to have made that happen? I know like you would have to do it like forcibly against her will, so that wouldn't have really fit with the story, but that's what I'm saying. Like there were options mm-hmm. and he was just like, I'm gonna leave it up to her. Didn't you just tell her you had this long ass conversation about how emotions are weakness and love is a weakness, so you expect this bitch who is in love with your nephew to act on non emotion and end the relationship? What world is this? I don't know. So, yeah, uh, there was just <laughs> there was just so much badness, you guys. I I can't. I will I gave this a 0.5 star. I mean, <laughs> I gave it a 1 because you have to on Goodreads. Otherwise, it doesn't oh. count. If I could give this a 0, I would have given it a 0. I thought Flame in the Mist was bad. This is just like she's given up. It was like, I've got I've got a publisher now. I'm going to literally just write whatever I want. People on YouTube are just like, she's got her loyal fans, Dude, so that is true. love anything she does. That is so true. Well, that's correct. So when Don and I finished this book, we said to ourselves, this book really instilled a fear inside of us. And we're like, it, 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 we just questioned, we questioned YA fantasy. And like, what was your thought on like, why, why were you questioning like every book you've ever read? I was, because the way she was writing books I was like is this how all books are written and I don't mean like fantasy like specific I just mean like when a book is told in first person or third person is the narrator always talking to the reader and saying Celine is sexy look yeah. at her yeah. look at her hot pants and so I would have to go to my bookshop and find books and look at a third person narrative and be like is this how this is always written I was constantly yeah. questioning how because books it's were written. so bad and distracting from yeah, an already distracting. from an already non-engaging story. So we decided to sit down and think about examples in YA literature where that kind of storytelling or the the character that we believe that Adie was trying to create in Celine, we we picked examples from YA where that was done successfully. So we're gonna just yeah. really quickly break yeah, that down. I mean if. I doubt you're listening to this if you like the story, but we don't want to just right. shit all over the book and then be like, okay, bye. We want to be like, this is, give specific reasons as why we don't like it and other books that we felt did it better. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, if you're new to the podcast, Elise and I are Y librarians. We have written for scholarly journals. We are critical readers. We have been on selection committees. We are basically trained to read critically. I am I am fine with reading a book for funsies, but it still has to have something. And this mm-hmm. book just I couldn't even enjoy this as candy. Agreed. Brain candy. And and at certain points in the story, it's like is this how I'm supposed to be reading this book? Why are we why is there repeated mention of her heaving bosom and like small waist? It's like what is happening? It was just again, you shouldn't be writing about that when you have like what I'm assuming to be like a centuries old feud between two vampire covens. Yeah, there's bigger. You have a to lot about. to talk about, dude. Stop wasting your time on Celine's body. And, I thought we're past that. And and what's 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 weird, and this is kinda not where we're going with this, but it's like maybe we'll just get into this when we talk about <laughs> Celine. All right. But okay. So the first thing we were gonna talk about is elements of a good paranormal plot. Mm-hmm. And why we felt that this was just a 450-page prequel and how this is not how we feel a series should be written. Once Mm -hmm. again, we've never written a book before, but we've read a lot. And just, like, how a series should not be written. Well, okay. So my prime example for a a book that has realistic elements but is also a paranormal story was uh, The Raven Boys. 
And I was thinking to myself, why did she waste so much time setting something up that she really... That the entire book was again just a setup for this thing at the end to jump into book two, with a lot with like nothing resolved. Nothing was resolved no, in this book. Nothing, except we know who the murderer is. It's yes, pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Um, therefore, it's a very shallow plot. There's not a lot to keep me with the story. In the Raven Boys, there is a central mystery um, uh, grounding the story, and that is who is Glendower. And is is Blue and Gansey going to is is Blue going to kill Gansey when she kisses him because it's her true love or whatever? Which is how this series was originally pitched. But either way, we have action that surrounds both of those storylines throughout the entire series, as well as smaller little um, character conflicts and and issues that come up in each book that drives the plot of that book, but ultimately also has to do with the final mystery. That did not happen here. There was nothing grounding the mystery except the the mystery of who is committing the murder. Okay? So she did not make her vampire coven feud the center of the story, which is what she needed to have done, because clearly that's d- the direction she's going. Um, Bastion, as he's dying, or as he's, like, trying to go find Celine rather, he randomly mentions that a Saint Germain is not supposed to strike a Grimaldi. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you mention in the plot before now that those two families had ill will towards each other? I just thought it was because y'all are hot for Celine and you don't like that he likes her. But you're telling me now that this is like a centuries old blood pact that you're not supposed to raise your hands against each other? Well, see, where, where was that? None of that was anchoring or acting as like the foundation for the story. And again, to have a good paranormal plot where there's probably a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, there was no center. Yeah. And because there was no center, she just kept adding more stuff and more stuff Mm -hmm. and more stuff and nothing, nothing's getting resolved. Yeah. And um, my example was There Will Come a Darkness, which is by Katie Rose Poole. It's a debut, Mm -hmm. and she has several characters, a very intricate world. And what's grounding her story is the prophecy. The prophecy's grounding the story. And there's new challenges and new issues being brought up, but things are resolved by the end of the story so that you're engaged the whole time. And so when there's a cliffhanger at the end... You're not going into book two thinking, wait, what's the silver yeah. veil again that was mentioned two times? Yeah. Who are the fallen? What is the dangerous? Because we would we should already know what the main point of the feud is. We should know what the Sylvan Veil vale and the Sylvan, Sylvan Wild. Wild is too. Yeah. Sylvan oh, Veil really? oh, see, is where the good it. people go and Sylvan Wild is where the bad people go or something like that. Missed it. Yeah, there's two different ones. Um but nothing. It's not answered. And she throws in random characters. What was the point of Ashton and and the other boy? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. There was no point in that. So you have to... And she, you know, she did that in The Flame of the Mist, where she would just introduce more stuff and not answer the big thing at the end of the book. Um, yeah. So, once you, like you said, there was nothing really grounding the story. Um, the romance between mm-hmm. uh, Celine and Bastion was as you have mentioned in several podcasts a lot of eye glancing and heavy breathing and I think they may have been alone together three times the third time they were almost banging yeah. Yeah. uh there's no I think they get to know each other one time as he's escorting her down the street that's it yeah and like they both share their truths in this moment that's supposed, and that's to, supposed be, like, to be like breaking and intimate by the time the book ends, they've only known each other a month. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't feel intimate connections with people one month after being around them, even if I have, like, an in-depth conversation. There's a lot more that needs yeah. to be shared between two people before that's happening. Yeah. So there's no... there. I, I wasn't feeling the romance. It's just her constantly reminding us of how attractive he is with his gunmetal eyes. Right. That's it. Yeah. She's just constantly, and how other people find him attractive, and how, and he's constantly telling us that, oh my goodness, I'm such a powerful person that no one can stand up to me, and there's no, there's no 
the no character. There's no reality. There's no depth here. There's no, like, uh, to bring in, I cannot, I can't I don't even know how many times I have compared this book to Six of Crows in terms of what I think she's trying to do between two characters, but, like, these people do not exist in Six of Crows. And yet, I finished that series missing the yeah. characters that were either no longer with us or that had left the story for some reason. And that is when you know, like, you have brought real life into a story. Like, fantasy and paranormal isn't devoid of any kind of, like, real life meaning because you do it through your characters and how they handle conflict and how they speak to themselves and other people and deal with their issues. And, like, this... Dude, if I yeah. knew somebody like Celine, I'd be like, okay, bye. No. Gross. And, I mean, considering the amount of people that are in Six of Crows, um, and I, I, I like to compare these two books because they're duologies, and Six of Crows and this and The Beautiful are probably comparable in length. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have an, a, a intricate world yeah. and um, a history of family with Kaz and yeah. Bastion. Like, there's a lot here. And the relationship between Kaz and Inej is fantastic and I don't even think they touch I don't they don't kiss I think maybe he holds her hand at the end and it's this I would yeah. I would say it's a, a pretty sweeping romance and I think the way um Bardugo made it well is that we really got to know Kaz as mm-hmm. a person mm-hmm. she developed him as a person so when he doesn't want to be in a relationship with Inej, we already know why. We don't yeah. need Cass to tell us, I'm holding her yes. arms like, I don't yes. want to love her because I'm just going to call her and cause her nothing but misery. We don't. He doesn't need to tell us that because we know about his, his brother and we know what yeah. Pekka Rollins has done to him. We know why he wears gloves. We know. And so, you know, she doesn't do that. Everything is told to us. Yeah. Nothing's ever shown to us. Yeah. She's just constantly telling Oh, I don't want Pippa around me because I'm going to. Yeah. No, don't. You know, you have to develop your characters so that the reader can infer. Mm-hmm. And I don't like when characters give themselves pep talks on the page. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in this book. Yeah. In the end, when she's like going up against Nigel to oh, foil. This is indicative. The, this yeah, is yeah, indicative yeah. of the writing. Go ahead. Okay. So she goes up against Nigel, who is a grown-ass man. He, he's got, like, a white mustache, she points out at some point. So I'm assuming he's in his, like, 50s. And this teenage girl is somehow able to outwit this guy. And she's like, what does she say? Oh, damn it. Oh, she's like, I, I fell forward to pretend like I was a lamb going to the slaughter, but I wasn't a lamb. I'm a lion. And I was just like, yikes. So let's talk about all of that because we have thoughts. <laughs> so a, a, a writer, a different writer would have let the reader go along with the rules and she would have just slumped yeah. over and we'd be like, oh no. Yeah. But then yeah. she shows us that she's not a, a lamb by right. taking the knife out and stabbing him. That does not happen. No, here. she tells us everything that she's yeah. going to do and it's, therefore it's, it's boring. It's oh, I don't, yeah. I don't. Yeah, it's boring. And so we're trying to figure out why is she writing Celine like this? Who is this book for? And we have decided that it is for a 12-year-old girl. Not a girl. Who does not know how to infer feminism. I, it's or just boy. anyone who is like, maybe you've never picked up a book before. Never. Just you're, you're completely new to reading as, as a thing, which I don't know how you manage to do in public school. But this book is just not for anybody. If you've read a book before, you will clearly see how this book is like, what is happening? Yikes. But yeah, just a very young reader who maybe has never encountered the concept of like feminism as it's like told to them. Mm -hmm. So like you, there's two different, like you can observe feminism in that like a woman should be treated the same, but then there's being, being explained the theory and like what that means. Those are two different experiences. So, like, someone never being explained what that is. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's not even any feminism in this. No, but it's like, she's... she's Why it's are we forced, commenting on her body? It's forced... And that's the problem. It's forced feminism. I'm, I'm wearing 
I'm scared, but I'm strong, and oh I'm not going to let some man tell me what to do, and I'm, you know, I'm going to best this man, and I'm not a lion yeah. or a lamb or whatever, yeah. but my waist is tidy, and my yeah. boots are big, and everybody comments on it. How, who, what are you telling a twelve this 12-year-old 12 exactly. girl reading this book? Exactly, because I was a very small child. I would have looked at that and be like, well, that's not going to be me. Dang. Thanks. Like, I mean, what is this? Well, I did have big boobs. I didn't have a small waist. So would that, what did that do for me at 12? Did you also have green eyes? No. Because apparently green eyes and jet black hair is the, like, again, just any time. Standard beauty. Yeah, like anytime you really fixate on a character's body, it's, it's, it's implied that this is how you should look. And if you don't, it's wrong. It's like, we are past yeah. that point where we should even be like fixating on a girl's body in literature. And the fact Let's that move on. every man is in love with her makes it even worse. Why are you including Odette female to the like male gaze? I don't understand. Yes. Every man and woman is in love with her for her oh raven hair God. and her green eyes and her tiny waist and her huge tits. Yes, that this is what you're telling girls or boys and women yeah. and yeah. No. Yeah. I'm I'm <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is what this book is for. There's no inference. No. There's no thought. There's no requirement of thought. Right. Do not give this to your teen book club because you will have nothing to discuss. Oh, well, except you will, about but how, how bad. how to not write a book. <laughs> right, right, right. So oh, let's get man. into Celine a little bit more. And we were talking about why she's such a bad character. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've said it best when you called her... What... You didn't say self-centered, but you like her characters are so like obsessed with themselves. Yeah, or... that's exactly what I said. Yeah, yep. and Celine is very much she's so self-centered. Yep. Everything is about her, mm -hmm. and but the big thing is that she's a Mary Sue, and yep. that everybody loves her for her wit and her cunning, yet she doesn't really come across as witty and coming and com not coming cunning. Oh my god. <laughs> People are constantly telling us she is. She does never show us Not that she's witty. Not once. She and, and Adie positions her in these instances where, oh, I'm going to give my, my main character the answers, and I'm going to put her in a position where she's going to figure it out herself, but ultimately another character is going to step in and disrupt that, thereby saving her. Like when she's in the jail, and she's like planning her midnight escape, well, the grandma comes in and offers okay. you pasta. And then yeah. you're like, I can go. Then she's like, ooh, let me get down this hallway. Um, yeah. Um, one thing we didn't mention that we talked about earlier, go, start going back to how poorly <laughs> feminist book this is. So we're trying to figure out why is Pippa such a dingleberry <laughs> why does she constantly drop wine on herself why is she constantly screaming why is she doing these stupid things and there's, we have discovered there's literally a point in the book where she's attempting to communicate her 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 frustration with celine keeping her at arm's length and intentionally like pushing her away in order to keep her safe which i think pippa has figured out but she's like flailing her arms and it like gets stuck on her dress and then she's like oh bother and then that's it. She doesn't finish her story. We never get to hear her thoughts on anything. It's like, oh my god. Literally her sleeve gets caught on her dress and she gets so distracted and huffy that she doesn't finish her story. But why? I don't fucking Why know. do we need this Pippo acting like this? Why at the masquerade ball is there a girl in the middle of the party oh, with her yes. boobs out drinking champagne and everyone has their attention on her? And she's pouring it all over herself revealing her boobs and her dress. Like what is Why? going on? What is the point? Is it in, I, The only reason we can come up with is to make Celine look better. Yeah. It's all about her. Yeah. So she, she positions other females in the book and there are not many females in this book. There are a lot of guys. Um, but she, she positions them against each other so that they, they, they shine a light towards Celine. And again, that is not feminist. No. Our differences is not what makes another woman better or this person better over here. You know, it's like when a guy says, oh, you're not like other women. That's not a compliment. 
we should not be degrading each other. Oh, I'm better because I'm different and I'm the I'm the female pinnacle. It's like this is what that book does. It like builds her up. Even Annabelle, like you mentioned yeah. it, or, or in the, one of our early podcasts, that Annabelle is supposed to have a business mind, but she's standing there bitching and moaning about how come no one's coming to her table. But oh, here comes Celine with her her gorgeous handkerchiefs. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so even Annabelle has no has nothing no to actual offer. substance and then we're supposed to care when she gets murdered like three chapters later like that's not how that works back so to Celine anyway, back to Celine being a Mary Sue so we're <laughs> like who is a better character that people actually like right for who they are and I know this is going back kind of far but we came up with uh, Katniss um Everdeen from Hunger Games and Katniss has lots of flaws and she shows them constantly and everybody loves her she's the revolution she's the Maka Jay everybody loves her but why what did she do to make this happen mm -hmm. she has compassion she's not mm -hmm. self-centered yeah. she cares for other people and when they're on the Hunger Games she cares for Rue even though it's going to right. get her killed and she cares for them in a way that is not um, egotistically passive and what I mean by that is Look how she pretends, or well, look how she cares for Pippa. She doesn't bother to give Pippa the information she needs to be safe by explaining to her why she's going to step out of her life for a little bit. Mm -hmm. She just leaves. You don't do anything for that person but confuse them and cause them pain by just ghosting them like that. You know, that's not, that's not emotionally intelligent. You know, and yeah. that bothers me. This is a very emotionally unintelligent character. And I think, I was explaining to a coworker that like, I think teens deserve better. Oh, for like, sure. In the day and age that we live in. Maybe 10 this, years ago, this would have been good. Definitely. Not not, not good, but it would have been less offensive. Yeah. But we, we don't live in a fairy tale, naive feminist world, naively feminist world where it's like, oh, I don't want to wear a dress. So that means that I have a mind of my own. Like, no, there's real shit happening out there. And, like, this is not a book we should be giving them to waste their time with mm -hmm. or learn anything from. And not wearing a dress doesn't make you a feminist. Mm -hmm. Like, you can still wear a really nice dress and still kick ass. Exactly. I. It's just all... You know, that, feminism that's of like 30 years that's ago. That's lazy. If Absolutely. you think that not having your character not wear a dress and have Odette wear pants and yeah. have her, that be pretty much her character. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much what we get from Odette, is that she wears pants. And she's the most interesting character in the book, um, and I was really disappointed by her character development. You know, clearly she's she's probably setting up some kind of, like, queer romance for book two, um, but she did not set the seeds enough. No. They were together maybe one or two scenes. One scene. Yeah. After she fucking dropped wine on herself. Again, Pippa. Okay, so finally, her world being clumsy is, is not is not a. I thought we were done with that trope. I thought we were too. I thought we were yeah. done with that. I'm I'm really over the clumsy female trope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, her world and Elise already kind of really went into. <laughs> this is what she should have been focusing on: is the fallen and the yeah. brotherhood and the Sylvan Wild and the Sylvan Veil, vale. yeah. but Adie puts so much time and energy into developing food and how it looks in Celine's dresses and pages and pages and pages of her sewing these dresses and how they look and how Odette's outfit looks and how the restaurant upstairs and all the people are gambling. That had nothing to do with nothing. And the yeah. masquerade ball. And I mean, yeah. it was a whole chapter on nothing. Yeah. It, and it's like she it's like she went to one creative I know this sounds so mean but it's like she went to one creative writing class and they were like you need to describe your book so that people can be immersed in your story and that's all she got she only took that one class and didn't learn how to develop her world that is not world development so when you throw in like you said just oh I'm just gonna throw in um uh something about Nicodemus in his house or mm -hmm. I'm just gonna throw in Emily over here and her butter lemon ribbon. Yeah. That is not developing your world. I'm not gonna remember that in book two because right. if you as the author don't take time to make it significant, how am I supposed to think it's significant? Yeah, for sure. I'm not. 
I'm yeah. only going to look at stuff where you really take the time to focus on. Yep. And that's how I know, okay, and well, this that is that was her clothing and her yeah. boobs and her her glowering and scowling at, at Bastion. That was what most of this book was about. Yeah. And sitting here as I'm, like, preparing for this podcast, and I'm like, what was in this 420-page book? That's it. What was in it? I, there was literally, yeah. you could probably fill two pages yeah. of the folklore and the world. Unfortunately. The vampire world. Yep. And the rest of it is just, I don't know. I don't know what was in this book. So... That is why we've been shitting all over this book, basically, is because... There's a lot of issues here. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot to unpack. Like I said, I have read some fluffy stuff. I personally consider Throne of Glass to be fluffy. It was entertaining. Mm -hmm. Selene is a fucking Mary Sue, guys. Everybody, Selena, everybody loves her. Yeah. However, she's a good, she's a good she enough character. Her, I'm not saying that value. it's all fluff. I thought yeah. Manon's storyline was great. And, you know, but a lot of that stuff was tropes. And yeah, I wasn't going into that book thinking that it is going to be a critical good time. And it it was a lot of bullshit going on and I was loving it. Yeah. So I have no problem reading fluff. Right. <sighs> but this this book was just not centered whatsoever. And it was difficult to read. It was, it was difficult to difficult. sit and read. It was difficult to not laugh at it because the tone of the story was not clear at all. You know, if I'm reading a smutty vampire book, fine. Yeah, but, but commit. I mean, I read Fifty Shades of Grey. I enjoyed it because I knew what I was getting going exactly. in. Exactly. You know, but ugh, don't confuse your reader by, like, fixating on, on issues and, and details that really don't add any meat to your story. Like, again, unfortunately, dresses and kind of thing like yikes somebody mentioned on goodreads how she kept talking about corsets and she was like oh my god everybody knows that women wore corsets they were like women probably wore have been wearing corsets longer than than the haven't yeah been wearing corsets yeah <sighs> everyone has all teens have seen corsets we've all seen um pirates of the caribbean where right, she freaking right, falls over the right. boat because her course is too tight like yeah this was like historical fiction for People who have never read a book. People who have never read a book, yeah. And I don't know who that reader is. I, I really don't. I don't know who that reader is. So, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Reach out yeah. to us. How did you feel about The Beautiful? You. Did you love it? I I have heard some people on BookTube who loved it. Gave it a five. Gave it a four. They absolutely loved it. And, hey man, good on you. Sure. But, you know, you like what you like. No, yep. There's nothing wrong with that. But we didn't. But I'm going to explain why I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, which I think we did quite thoroughly. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. So there will not be another week of this. We mm -hmm. just had to just get it out of the way. Yeah, we, did. we had to rip that bandaid off. Oh, my God. Um, We're going to take a break from Read Along with the Universe. We, I don't, are we going to do Ninth House or Call the Hawk? Call Down the Hawk. We are going to do Ninth House in October and then Call Down the Hawk This is October. In, I'm sorry, November. And then we're going to do Call Down the Hawk in December because there's not really anything coming out in December. No, nothing comes out in December right. ever. So... All right. Well, I can tell you that I've already read Ninth House, and it is amazingly better than this. So there will be no shitting. I mean, it's not going to be a glowing review. Ever we're gonna, we are going to pick it apart because that's what we this do. is a critical reading podcast <laughs> series that we do. Um, we're not doing this for free books and to kiss publishers' asses. We are here yeah. to actually critique a book. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you are enjoying it. Um, no one has said otherwise, so true. I guess it's okay. We're not getting any hate tweets. On we Twitter. aren't getting any hate <laughs> tweets. Um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks to do our October wrap up mm -hmm. and our November read. Uh, read along with the universe. No, and our, our predictions. Predictions. Mm -hmm. I have to say our November predictions. Yeah. So thank you for sticking it out with us with this horrible this <laughs> book. I won't say it. it's this book. Thank you. This book, which was not for us. So, oh God. Yeah. I regret all the decisions I've made. I was like, yikes. Thank you. We'll catch you in the next podcast. Bye.